So you want to be a great mead maker. Here are the eight mead making mistakes that all beginners should avoid to be great. Let's get started. So my name is Garrett and I run this channel, Man Made Mead. I have made a lot of mead, over 200 different recipes at this point, and I have a lot of videos. So I am uh, very well versed in this and I would consider myself somewhat of an expert at this. Let's talk about these beginning mead mistakes that you should avoid if you're deciding to make mead. Now, some of these are um, applicable for later on when you are going to go pro and things, but here are the eight mistakes to avoid. We're gonna run down them real fast and I'll explain each one to the best of my ability. Let's get started. So let's talk about the first mistake most people make. Number one, most people assume that the yeast you use doesn't really affect your brew. Um, I didn't understand this until I started using different yeast, but every single yeast kind <laughs> makes a different product. For example, you can go to the regular grocery store, buy some bread yeast, which is widely available, throw that into a mead, and then also in tandem, let's say, throw a wine yeast in and you will come out with very different products. Now, there's also different kinds of yeast. When it comes to wine yeast, you have some that are more suited for specific kinds of brews. You have ale yeast, you have lager yeast, you have, I mean, sake yeast. You have things that are catered for different kinds of flavor profiles. Every yeast creates a different flavor profile. Now, some people are gonna get angry and say that yeast are yeast and it's not true. Those people don't know how to brew. The first thing you need to know is that yeast, well, yeast have multiple things about them. They have different flavor profiles, but they also have different kind of uh, specs or needs. So each yeast has a temperature range that it likes to ferment in best. It has a somewhat relative alcohol by volume cap, meaning the highest it can go. Now that's, uh, it can be stretched a little bit because some yeast can go above their alcohol cap if you do the right things. Um, there are some other important things to know about yeast, like you might find information about attenuation, which is essentially how much sugar that yeast will convert to alcohol. So if it said on the yeast, 50% sugar or 50% attenuation, that means 50% of the sugars in the brew would be converted to alcohol, the other 50 would not. Most of the time they just say high attenuation or low attenuation, stuff like that. Flocculation is how well the yeast fall out of suspension over time, or flocculate. Those are a couple important things to know about yeast. If you understand your yeast, you can start to cater to their needs. So assuming that all yeast are the same will get you in trouble because you won't feed them and give them what they need. That leads us into the second thing, which is understanding yeast health. Yeast health is exactly what, I, what it sounds like. It is how healthy are your yeast? How well are they fermenting? Yeast are just like us, they need food. And their food comes in the form of yeast nutrient. And there are multiple kinds of yeast nutrient you can purchase. For example, there's dimonium phosphate, which is a yeast nutrient that is basically nitrogen. It goes straight into the brew and yeast use it for their fermentation. They use it in their health. It's not the most nutritious thing for them, but it can be helpful. There are other things like Fermade O and Fermade K. Fermade O is an organic yeast nutrient that has complex, I don't know all the, the innards of it, but essentially it's like all of the vitamins and minerals that your yeast need to properly um, ferment and kind of get full. Fermade K is the not as organic version in that it has some dimonium phosphate, Lots of people do not consider dimonium phosphate to be natural, therefore it is not the natural way. There are other things you might find. LD Carlson has a yeast nutrient. You have things like bread, excuse me, um, yeast holes, which are essentially just dead yeast. You can create yeast holes by boiling bread yeast. That's a relatively okay way to give some yeast nutrient. Essentially your yeast 
need to be healthy. They need to be fed the right things. Um, on that note, I'm gonna dive just a little bit deep. If you use dimonium phosphate, your yeast will stop metabolizing and using dimonium phosphate once they hit 9% ABV. So you cannot use dimonium phosphate as a sole yeast nutrient. Rather, you need to, um, you could use it roughly up to 9% and then I would stop using it there because it will create some off flavors as the yeast do not metabolize it. Yeast health is very, very important. Um, you can also help your yeast by giving them um, a pre-workout of sorts. If you use a thing called GoFirm, whenever you first introduce your yeast to water, GoFirm is like pre-workout for yeast. It gets into their cells and essentially just pumps them up and gets them ready for the fermentation. You don't have to use it, but it is helpful. Yeast health is very important. There are a lot of mead makers out there who do not understand why their yeast are struggling. In reality, it's because they're not giving their yeast proper nutrition and they're not helping their yeast be healthy. Make sure you give them the right food, the right temperature range, and that you just take care of them. Number three. So this one's very, very important. I didn't learn this until, like I said, uh, way, way later on in my brewing career, meads 150 plus. And um, it's all about balancing your brew. There is this triforce of balance, and I will link down a video that's even a better description of this below from my friend Doing the Most, who talks about this, about balancing a brew. But the three things you have to, use when you're balancing a brew or, or think about are the tannic value, which is the um, how that mead feels when you drink it, if it kind of clings around or if it washes like water. If you think when you drink water, it normally just kind of goes over your tongue and it's gone. If you drink a red wine, it normally kind of sucks the moisture out of your mouth and kind of does has a little different feel. Tannic value is important. You have sweetness, simply enough. How is the sweet is it? Is it sugary? Is it not sugary? And lastly is the acid balance. If you have all three of those things, what you'll find is your brew will have a much easier time being more palatable. Brews that only have sweetness and acidity, but no tannic value are not gonna be as um, enjoyable as one that has all three or any uh, conjunction of them. You need all three to be successful. The way you adjust each one is via a couple things you can use for your sweetness, sugars of any kind, honey, regular sugar, maple syrup, all that stuff can adjust sweetness. That one's pretty basic. Adjust it to your sweetness level you want. Acidity can be balanced with a multitude of things, but you can use anything that has an acid base. So lemon juice, lime juice are okay. They kind of add more flavors sometimes. I like to use um, either tartaric acid, which is the main acid in grapes, malic acid, which is the main acid found in pears and apples and those things, or citric acid, which is found in lemons and limes and oranges. Each one's a little bit different. Citric acid is bright. Tartaric is a little more mellow. Malic is in between the two. You can also use the thing called acid blend, which is the blend of the three. Essentially what you do is you take any of those acids and you add a tiny bit amount to your brew, whichever one you feel like you need, and that helps to bring the acidity out. Now we go to the tannic value, which can be adjusted via lots of different things like oaking your brew, whether that be putting it into a barrel using oak cubes, chips, spirals, granulated oak, any of those things. You can also use stuff like powdered wine tannin, which again, hopefully you're seeing some photos of this, but powdered wine tannin is very nice. It adds tannic value, that clinging feeling, and the secret power of it is it actually helps to clear a brew. So balance those three things. You kind of have to play around with it in order to find the balance, and it takes time and effort. You will not get it on the first try. You might not get it on the fifth try, but continue to work on balancing those things with your palate in order to make the best brew possible. 
That's the only way you're gonna ever be a successful mead maker is if you will learn how to balance those. Next, we have the truth that recipes are great and they're nice to follow, but they don't always fit your palate. You might have just started brewing and you take that Joe's Ancient Orange recipe or that Braise One Month Mead recipe or that Viking Blood Mead recipe and you make it and you go, man, it's just not very good. That isn't always attributed straight to the recipe. It is also based on your, your palate because every recipe is catered to, I believe, the original creator's palate. Now, they've probably tested it and had a bunch of people try it and say it's good, but that doesn't mean that it fits your palate. Feel free to adjust any recipe you find, whether it's my recipe that you might have found on a video or one of the big ones, like I just said. You can adjust it. Use less fruit. Use more fruit. You know, maybe use juice. Or you say, hey, I need to adjust the acid balance, so you throw in some malic acid. Feel free to adjust recipes as you need them. That's totally legal. That's just how it works. A lot of beginning mead makers follow recipes and get upset because the recipe doesn't turn out as good as they expected. And that's not their fault, and that's just the truth. Every palate is different. Follow recipes, be willing to change some things. Number five, time can fix most mead problems. And I think this is something that um, we don't always rely on. We, we know that patience is important, but uh, we don't like to be patient. So letting your meads age over time can fix some things. Most of the time when your brew is way too alcoholic and it just bites you and punches you in the face, uh, that, that can be fixed by essentially just, of, I mean, letting it age, that goes away. Now, this isn't true of every situation. If you have um, some problems such as, well, if you have a thing called a fusel, which is an a off alcohol that is created when yeast ferment and are stressed, some fusels will age out and will go away and some will not. And so you kind of have to, you have to know a little bit about them to fix that, but you have to be patient and see. Essentially, time fixes problems, but it doesn't fix all of them. So do not depend on time, or do not think that time will fix everything. Good mean making, um, I mean, good yeast health, good recipe development, and that stuff will, will fix most of your problems. Does this mean that you need to throw away that brew that might not be successful? No, but uh, just know that, that time is helpful in some regards. That seems like a Debbie Downer. That's just something I've experienced. I've taste tested a lot of my meads recently that are older, that had problems, and they didn't quite get better. So everyone had told me in the beginning, just let it age for two years and it'll be better. Not always true. Number six is experience is important and it is key to understanding this process. We've kind of talked about that. Yeast health, you don't understand what yeast health means until you, you don't give yeast what they need and they give you a bad product. You don't understand recipes until you experience them or test them out. You don't really understand what it means to balance a brew until you start to play around with things. My advice to you is to start making more mead. And that sounds like, you know, the, the key thing like, Oh, you're bored? Just make more mead. No, I'm saying this in the regard that it will help you understand the process. Experience is key. Start making more mead. Once you make one, go ahead and start to make another one and see if you can do something a little different based off the experience you have. Number seven, gravity readings are so important. So there's a couple important things you need when you are making mead. You need some, some equipment to be a better mead maker. Things like auto siphons, which are basically a tubing and this pump, it allows you to move a brew without uh, exposing it to oxygen. Tubing, we just talked about. Stuff like bottling wands, so you're not pouring your mead into bottles. And the most important one is a hydrometer. A hydrometer is this tool 
for measuring gravity. Gravity is how dense a liquid is. When you first mix your, mix your mixture up, your honey and water and yeast, if you take a gravity reading, what you'll notice is that that hydrometer will float at a certain point. Let's say it floats at 1.080. If you have thrown a yeast in that can ferment through 1.080 gravity, or roughly about 10.5% ABV, your yeast will more than likely, if given the right things, ferment through all of that meaning that your, your gravity at the end of fermentation will be 1.000. It is very important for you to have these numbers because you can know how alcoholic your brew is. You can also know how to repeat said brew if the recipe is good. You might find some wonderful people on the world who have just thrown things into a, a container, not taken a gravity reading, and then said, go make this recipe. You have very little knowledge about how to do that. Gravity readings will help you with that. It'll also help you know when your brew is done fermenting. It'll help you know what your final gravity is if you decide to back sweeten and or just want to know the final gravity. That's very, very important. So make sure you have a hydrometer. And the last thing that is so important is to understand kind of the dangers of, of mead making. And that is that you have to not only take care of your yeast when they're trying to make them healthy, but you also need to do so whenever you are ready to um, back sweeten or appropriately change a mead. Let's say you made that brew 1.080. It ferments to 1.000. It's at 10 and percent. Your yeast can go to, let's say 14%. If you put more honey in there, those yeasts are going to wake back up and say, hey, let's party. Let's do it again. And they'll just start fermenting again. If you want to retain or to add sweetness without more fermentation, you have to know how to stabilize or pasteurize. Stabilizing is a form of using potassium sorbate and potassium metabisulfite to halt any further fermentation. This, it, let it be known that these things are not killing yeast. Rather, they, in conjunction, are making the, the area a non, a not fun place for the yeast to reproduce. Therefore, they won't reproduce more. If there are still yeast in said brew that are alive and you don't get off of those yeasts after stabilizing with those things, they will still eat the sugars. So I recommend to stabilize after the yeast have fallen out of suspension. If you would like to do this in a more normal, uh, natural way, you can pasteurize, which means you can heat your liquid up, which kills the yeast. Now this is harder to do in larger batches, but it is possible in smaller bottles. On that same note, if you're wanting to make a sweeter mead, you, can, you have two options. You can either do what we just said, or what I just said, and let your yeast finish fermenting, stabilize slash pasteurize and back sweeten, or you can attempt to cap out your yeast. Again, let's say our yeast can go up to 14%. If you provide enough honey for the yeast to get up to 14%, plus, you mean you give them, you go over that, Theoretically, the yeast will, when they hit that cap, stop. Now, lots of yeast are notorious for going over the cap, so you um, you might find that your 14% yeast said, nah, I'm gonna keep going, and goes to 16%. This is a little more tough uh, way of back sweetening because then you end up with like this insanely high ABV brew. It'll be sweet, but you're having to use a ton of honey. Kind of the two ways to do this. So I know that's a lot. And I hope that this has been somewhat helpful. I've made this video four years ago and I, I made it when I was still a beginning brewer. And a lot of the things I've said today are what I said back then. I just have more information. Listen, I want you to be a good mead maker. I, I don't want you to be bad at this. And I want you to be able to take brews to people and encourage them to not only want to buy mead, but to also drink mead that you provide. Your friends might love you, and that's awesome. But if you're not bringing, well, let's say this, they'll take free booze, but if that free booze is not very good over time, they might stop taking it. And if your friends stop taking your free booze, you should really take a step back and ask what's going on. Hope you enjoyed this episode and this 
video, please go ahead and hit subscribe. I have a lot of videos on this channel. I've made a lot of recipes and I feel very confident in my skills. Go check those things out. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in a future video. Cheers.